The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! <laughs> you think he's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? Hey, well, I must have not been paying attention. When you were just talking to me Do you think that she could repeat the question? And I listen more attentively There must have been something In all of that nothing That wasn't quite so easy to see And I must have missed something When you were just talking to me 30 more seconds, Ed. We got, we got plenty of music to keep us off. Beautiful. That's what I want to hear. That's a real producer. All right, we got it on your page, my page, the Valley Peachy page, the one sound off page. I think we're good. All righty. Our first show of the new year. Hi, I'm Tom Duggan here at the uh, Paying Attention Podcast. Hi, it's up. Two Guys Smoke Shop here at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. And we've got a, uh, a great treat to start the week, uh, start the year, start the decade with you. Technically, we're not starting the decade, though. Everybody on the news got that wrong, Ed. I've, it's a technicality. Yeah, like they always go, oh, it's the beginning of the decade. No, the, the decade starts at year one. There was no year zero. I know. So the decade starts at year one. That was so long ago. Can't I we know, just make it simple? They, everybody's got everybody's to <laughs> take a shortcut to everything. So I'm yelling at the TV screen on, on, uh, on uh, New Year's Eve every time somebody on CNN says, oh, it's the beginning of a new decade. No, it's really not. Um, hi. So uh, we, uh, we have a, a, a great couple of guests, three guests with, you, with us tonight. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the opioid crisis. It's going to be part two of our opioid summit that we had. Uh, we started last week with the four police chiefs, Police Chief uh, Alan Denaro from Haverhill, uh, North Andrew Police Chief Chuck Gray, uh, Boxwood Police Chief Jim Ryder, and my good friend, uh, Joe Solomon, the police chief in Methuen. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more. But first, we've got some breaking news. I think we got some news. Do we have some breaking news? We do. Breaking news. Breaking news. Breaking news in the Valley Patriot. My job is to entertain. Breaking news. Breaking news. Congress shall make no laws. All right. Extra, extra. All right. So first breaking news. The uh, Massachusetts State Legislature has decided that they're going to ban menthol cigarettes. As of yesterday, menthol cigarettes are now illegal in Massachusetts. Now think about this, folks. Can you imagine the utter stupidity of the legislature in Massachusetts where heroin injection sites, state funded, that's okay. Marijuana, that's okay. But Newports, Newports, that's where we draw the friggin' line. Can so you? Are you a criminal now? I, I, it, it's unbelievable. I, so, like, think about this. I mean, I'm talking to, I talked to Diana Desagui, who voted for this, and I'm just so disappointed in her for voting for this. And the thing is, she hates conflict. So, like, we're friends, and we never talk politics. So I said to her at one point, you're not going to vote for that menthol ban, are you? And she didn't even bother to tell me she had already voted yes on it. She's like, well, we can talk about that later. Only to find out later that she voted for it. And so then I texted my state representative, Christina Minicucci, who's very, very liberal, but I thought she had a little bit more sense than this. And uh, I sent her a text and said, you didn't vote for that menthol ban, did you? And I got the typical liberal excuse. Well, they showed us studies and statistics that show that children start smoking using menthol cigarettes. I'm like, okay, so let me see if I understand this right. We have a right of privacy to do what we want with our own body. And a woman, if she wants to, can terminate a pregnancy at the ninth month if she wants to because it's her body and we should be able to do what we want with our own body when we want because we have a right to privacy. But menthol cigarettes, that's where we draw the line? Like, really? Yeah. So, look, we either have the right to do what we want with our own body or we don't. And I can't imagine that there's any study, any study out there, and I don't believe half the studies anyway because we all know how that works, right, Ed? 
with the, the government will commission a study, which means they pay for a study right. to get the results that they want so that they can outlaw something or change some law. And then they rely on a study says or statistics say, and it's all bullshit. That's all it is. Basically, they pay some money and supply the answers right. and then wait to hear well, right. what they want to yeah. hear. It's like, this, it's like this circular thing where you know, they pay to get you know, this, this so-called research done to get the answer that they want so that they can then create some law that they want. And I, I just don't understand. I don't understand the mentality of people sitting in the legislature whose job it is to run the government, yep. pave roads, pay for the military, pay for police officers, you know, uh, pay for like the EPA, make sure people aren't dumping chemicals into our, into our, our waterways. And you never hear about the study until afterwards, because if it comes back with the wrong answer, they don't release oh, right. the yeah, study. No, what they do is they commission two more studies. <laughs> right. That's what they do. And then they pick, they pick and choose the ones that they want. So the Massachusetts, so here, so think about how bad this is for business. The, the legislature says that they care about business. They're so full of shit. It's unbelievable. They don't care about business. They don't care about small businesses at all. I live in North Andover. I'm on Main Street. Every day, I go to Mike's Market on Waverly Road. Uh, the, the Zanakis family, great people, right? They have, uh, they have Takis Pizza out on Salem Street. They've got Mike's Market over on Waverly Road. Is, is that where Joe's used to jo be? We used to be Joe's, right. And then, I went there as a kid, even. Right? So the Zanakis brothers uh, took it over, and I think Mike Zanakis is the one that runs it. And every day, I go there. I get a two packs of cigarettes, and while I'm there... I get milk and, and maybe some eggs, maybe a couple bags of chips, maybe a two-liter bottle of Coke. I go, oh, cheese, some macaroni and cheese, just in case, you know, I'm in the office and you, I need to make you something. You get all the bachelor right. supplies. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm, I'm there and I'm probably spending 50 to 60 bucks. And now all that money's gone from poor Mike's Market because I'm not making two stops. Nobody's going to do that. I'm going to go to New Hampshire. I'm going to buy my cigarettes. I'm going to get a carton so I don't have to keep coming back every two days, right? right? And while I'm there, I'm going to get my eggs and my milk and my, and my Coca-Cola and whatever else I have to get. And the legislature couldn't care less. Couldn't care less. All the And places like you would think, Christina Minacucci, Linda Campbell, they represent Methuen. They're right on the border. Methuen has a hard enough time with businesses jumping the border to buy things because of the, the, pro, the sales tax as it is, right? right? But now you're going to completely – I don't understand. They outlawed it. They just outright now, outlawed it. Was this to say – I can shoot heroin in a, in, a, in a safe injection site in Springfield, but I can't smoke a menthol? Well, was this to save the children? Clearly, they don't uh, want of to course. save it's you. It's always to save the children. It's always to save the children. Well, you know, that's – they're trying to put in flavored tobacco bans right. on – Right. Premium cigars, right. which children don't smoke anyway. Right. And yet, have you been in the vodka aisle lately? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, there's every flavor of vodka in right. the world, but that's not a problem. And then I love the bogus excuse that I get from every liberal that I talk to that, that's for all this banning stuff. If it saves one life. Okay, so then let's ban cars. Because cars kill more people every year than cigarettes do. I mean, if it saves one life, right? Yep. But, you know, they, they, don't, they don't really believe in anything they say they believe in. They're only there to control people's behaviors, to impose their personal wills onto other people. Well, that's, that's uh, item number one. Anyways, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we do have guests. Uh, we want to thank Joel Ferretra, who is our food, food columnist, our new food columnist. And I think starting next week... Uh, Joel's going to be doing a uh, live uh, food evaluation of whatever restaurant that he visited this week. Mm. And I think he went to Butter Bing's, which, I mean, that's an easy one to do. I figured he'd probably do that one first, yeah. but um, we, we, want, we want to thank Joel for that. Um, inauguration tonight in Lawrence for all the elected officials who got elected. Not that it matters to anyone and not that it's important to anyone, but I thought I would tell you. I mean, elected officials in Lawrence are just so totally useless. I don't even know why the city, the city is not just in total receivership. We have, in Lawrence, about 300 homeless people that we service. And Daybreak Homeless Shelter has 55 beds there full every night. And we have the TMF family dinner for the homeless every Wednesday night. We have between 50 and 75 people come to eat. And Neil Perry, the newly elected mayor of Methuen, comes and serves food to the homeless. Dave Beauregard, the newly elected city councilor in Methuen, comes to the TMF family dinner to help serve the homeless. Um, who else did I miss? Is another state uh, former former Methuen City Councilor Mount Ron Marsan comes and helps us serve. We at one point we had half the city council there serving food to the homeless. But you know, Ed, not one Lawrence elected official has ever come to TMF to help feed homeless people in Lawrence. It's a total joke. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no. First of all, the schools are in receivership, so the school committee is not even real. They have no power. 
Then you get the city council that does, literally does nothing. They sit there and they and they argue about stupid inner, you know, inside baseball politics about who got what job and who they donated to, but don't really actually solve anything. And then you've got the mayor who drives by these people and honks and waves at them and doesn't do anything to help. So I don't understand that at all. Anyways, uh, Monday night is the inauguration for the. Uh, newly elected Methuen mayor. There was a little bit of controversy over that. Steve Saber tried to micromanage what day they were going to be inaugurated. Um, I, apparently, he thought that the new mayor coming in needed the council's permission to schedule an inauguration. But he's been trying to micromanage the executive branch for the last two years, so that shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, and uh, so uh, Neil Perry got his way. He's going to have, they finally voted in a special meeting Monday night to allow them to have the inauguration. Monday night at, I believe, the high school at, I'm going to say 6 o'clock, but it might be 7. I don't have it in front of me. So they voted, but they don't really have any say on it. Right. Well, that's exactly right. They don't have any say on it because it's the outgoing council. The outgoing council can't schedule a meeting for the incoming council. So wouldn't that vote be a waste of time? You would think so. I mean, the new council is fully capable of scheduling their own meetings. You have the inauguration, the night of the inauguration. They have a special meeting that night to pick council president and vice president. And then they schedule their first official public meeting to do business. And they, sh they certainly don't need the, last, the outgoing council for any of that. They don't need permission from anyone to do that. But somehow, Sabre and McCarty may had to make a big thing of it. There was like a whole 30-minute discussion one night a couple of weeks ago about that whole thing. And it just kind of seemed like, I don't know, this is exactly what the voters rejected. You know, I mean, Perry won by 71% and they still didn't get the message. So hopefully moving forward, we've got a, a, a great new mayor coming in and a great new council coming in. There's two, maybe three obstructionists that are left on the council. We're going to check. We're going to call them the 29 percent. And the great new mayor is Neil here Perry next week. Right? He will be here next week. Now, normally he's here for the first week. Right. For those of you who are tuning in, expecting Neil Perry, um, he, he, will, he will be here. What's that, Phil? I'm, I'm not him. He's, yeah, he's not. He's not him. Uh, two more things. Uh, new Year's Eve shooting in Lawrence. Um, we thought it was after midnight, but it was like 11.53 or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, Lawrence Police Chief uh, Roy Vasque says that makes it three murders for 2019. I, I wish I could say publicly that I really don't believe that, but I don't want to get him mad at me, so I'm not going to say that. You're thinking he wants to carry I, it on I'm, the 2019 I'm thinking, stats? I'm thinking, no, no, I think I think it did happen before midnight. I just, right. I'm not buying the three number, though. I, I don't think. Okay. <laughs> I, think it, I think it might be different. But I, I don't want to get him mad at me because he's the police chief, and I right. like the guy. We, we grew up together, so um, he's definitely not the kind of guy you want mad at you. Nunzio DeMarker, a good friend of this show and the Valley Patriot and mine for a long time, passed away over this past week. Uh, I think with the day after Christmas or something like that, it's got to be really tough for his family. So we want to let them know that we're thinking about them. And the shooting on Christmas night, no, Christmas Eve, was it Christmas Eve? You know, it was Christmas Eve uh, in Methuen on Broadway. Uh, they have made an arrest. They do have the kid, 17 year old kid from Lawrence. Big surprise there. Um, so that's it for our breaking news. You want to go out with the breaking news? You think we should? Yeah, we Why should always not? go out with the breaking All news. Right. I want to thank Drama for cutting this for us. Got all kinds of people in the Hollywood helping us out. You get a lot of people to make music for you. I do, yeah. Music, movies, documentaries. All right, let's start with segment number two. Sitting here with us today is a... Uh, I, I, you know, I, I hate when people say my good friend and it's not really a good friend. I can't say he's really a good friend. We don't hang out. We don't go drinking together. We don't, uh, we don't, you know, hang out at each other's houses and have dinner together. But we've known each other a long time and we've always gotten along very well. And he's been on my radio show a number of times when we would, when the paying attention was on radio. Um, and he was a city councilor at the time. So we used to talk politics, but he's out of politics now. And one of the reasons I wanted to have him on the show is because last week we had the four police chiefs talking about the opioid crisis for two hours. And we got a lot of views on that. I didn't think people would hang in for two hours on a podcast. It's hard sometimes to get people to hang in for an hour. Yeah. And we had them for the two hours and we got, a, we got some pretty big numbers. So I'm really happy about that. And I started thinking afterwards, Phil, you know, we got the perspective of the police chiefs. We really should have the perspective of some of the frontline people that aren't connected to this, you know, to cities, municipalities, and not city workers. They don't have to watch what they say. And you were the first guy I thought of. So can you tell people what Merrimack Valley Substance Abuse Prevention sure. is and, um, you know, some of the stuff yeah. that you guys are doing? And, yeah, I, uh, 
Okay, we good? Well, yeah, no, pull him up a little bit. Pull him up a little bit? Yeah. How's that? How and are we doing? Let's get, yeah. Yeah, there you oh, go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I was one of the co-founders of Merrimack Valley Prevention and Substance Abuse Project, MVP ASAP, oh, about six, seven years ago now. <laughs> and what we are is we're a community group that does a lot of outreach. We work in the areas of... Uh, Prevention, education, outreach, and uh, treatment. And it's it's been an incredible ride. I, I got involved with this because uh, my daughter is a heroin addict who has been in recovery for over 11 years. And uh, I was happy she didn't die. I was one of those ones that got one of those phone calls that said, your daughter's in the hospital, she had an overdose, and they don't tell you how she's doing. Yeah. You have to go up. So when me and my wife, Fran, went up there, we didn't know if she was alive or dead. Thankfully, she was alive. She was flying up the rafters, but she was alive. And uh, that was the beginning of a long journey for her. That, and that was pre-Narcan, right? That was before uh, Well, the- it, it, yeah. It, it, Narcan wasn't distributed like it is now. Right. Uh it was out there, but no, not like it is now. But that was also pre-fentanyl. And let me put it this way. My daughter uh, stuck a needle in her arm for about eight or nine years. And not to say there's such thing as good heroin or bad heroin, but back then it was heroin. Right. If the drugs that were available now were available then, my daughter would be dead, and I wouldn't be sitting on this freaking show because I would probably say the hell with everything. Wow. In all honesty. Yeah, we would miss you, though. Well, uh, maybe so, but I would not as much as I would have missed my daughter. Yeah. Uh, so me and my wife, and I want to mention her, the new president that took over my place at MVP ASAP, Cole Welch, who is not only president of MVP ASAP, but also works in the Methuen de- uh, Police Department under the CARES program mm-hmm. as someone who does outreach, helps people get in the program. She's been a huge help to uh, my family support group, helping us get people into treatment. She's absolutely awesome, and I want to make sure. Let me put it this way. Joe Solomon. Uh, you guys used to not really get along all no, that well. No, no, no. <laughs> you guys no. didn't like each yeah, other. Yeah, when I was a politician, Joe and I didn't see eye to eye. But uh, it's funny how you come up with one issue that we both had a passion for, and we've worked real well together. I appreciate everything he's done. I appreciate him starting the CARES program. I appreciate all the support he's given MVP ASAP. And I know he appreciates what we contribute to help him, which is uh, a major problem in law enforcement. He was one of the people that suggested that I have you on. So, And I said to him... Smart really, man. I've always I, said he was smart Well, I man. said to him, I said, I thought you guys hated each other. He said, no, nah, that's all old yeah, hat. That's all, that's all yeah. in the past. Yeah, and you know, when you work... When on you a, remove the politics, he's actually a pretty good guy, right? Well, I mean, I tried to explain that to Jim McCarty one day. He was, he's not well, listening. Let me put it, like I said, you know, I mean, I was never a politician. You know that as well as I do. But when you find an issue that you uh, both care about, and it's, it's just important. And you're right. You can put your differences aside, and you can uh, work for the better good. And I have I will do that. I've done it with previous in- administrations with very little success. And I will be going before the city council, probably their second or third meeting, making my pitch again, and hopefully with a little more success. We've well, got a new mayor coming in that is very attuned to the opioid crisis and the homeless crisis. And I think you're going to have a much more sympathetic ear. Well, with him. we'll see. You want to know something? I've met with politicians up the ass that supposedly are in tune with the uh, uh, substance abuse problem. And they're good when they speak in public. They're good when they speak in the newspaper. They're good when they speak on the TV. But when it comes right down to it... When it comes to ponying up, they take a I'm going to be honest with you, and you mentioned her already. There's only one politician that I have ever worked with that has really had a passion for it. Can I guess? 
Diana DiZagrino. Absolutely. Yep. She, 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 is, is the, she is basically the founder of MVP exam. I mean, she is just unbelievable. She doesn't stop. And when no. she gets her hands on an issue, yes. the other politicians, they get their hands on an issue, like you said, they make they do a ribbon cutting, yeah. they make yeah. a quote in the paper, and then they don't do anything. She's actually yeah. doing the work. Yeah, she does. You know, you have others, you know, nothing against Nikki Songas. I met with her a dozen times for naught. Right. She listened. She was sympathetic. But you don't follow through. I've met a couple of times with Laurie Trahan. Uh, I'm not thrilled, but the jury's still out. Right. And if you're listening, Laurie, give me a call and maybe we'll follow up on it. Well, we have a, a friend that works in her office, Ryan Hamilton. So maybe Ryan can, can facilitate that. Well, for us. that would be nice because I plan on getting on her ass in the very near well, future. Well, good. And when you do, please let us know because I believe being someone who owns a newspaper, I'm really good at shaming people. And shame is a great motivator when you talk about politicians because all they care about is their image. Yeah, and and the thing is, like, uh, I'll give her credit. She uh, she came to one of MVP ASAP's quarterly meetings. Uh, she came to one of our board of directors' meeting. We gave her what I thought was some incredible suggestions. The funny thing is that would not only really help uh, the substance abuse problem, but would really give her some good right, press. Right, right. And I, I'll put her on the front page of my paper if she actually yeah, makes a difference. Yeah. And and I was uh, I was disappointed, but like I say, I haven't given up on her yet. Uh, Talk to us about what Merrimack Valley Substance Abuse sure. Prevention is. Okay, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll introduce your guests. Yeah, absolutely. And these guys because they had to sit through my foolishness at the beginning of the show. Yeah, so and I believe give them some me, time. It was, I I saw their faces. It was yeah. very freaking painful yeah. for them, but <laughs> sure. that, that's okay. Painful uh, for the audience too. Yeah. Uh, see, it wasn't as painful for me because I've listened to this shit right. over and right. over. Right. But I'm good with it, so it's okay. Uh, no, with uh, Merrimack Valley Prevention Substance Abuse, Substance Abuse Project MVP ASAP is is. Uh, Way back when, when uh, I was doing my empty chair show on Methuen Cable TV, I had Diana DeZogli on as a guest. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit after, and she wanted to get involved. And this is before there was an opiate crisis, so to speak. I did, we're talking going back six, seven years. And uh, what she did was she started to call a couple of uh, uh, town hall meetings, so to speak, mm -hmm. specifically for that. And... Christ, we would get 120, 130, 140 people showing up. She did that for about three straight months. And this is what makes Diana so smart. She knows she can't spend her whole time working on substance abuse. She turned it over to myself and the other co-founder, Jen Burns, who, you know, who has moved on, obviously, since then. But we took over MVP ASAP and made it a community group, and we've outreached to all the Merrimack Valley, across the borders in Salem, New Hampshire. And what we do is we're big on education. We're big on prevention. We go to a lot of uh, family events, and we hand out materials there. We're trying to educate the people who, the club that I used to belong to, the Not My Kid Club. Yep. And it's still a big membership out there. Mm -hmm. And what we did is, uh, I, can, I can pitch my podcast now too. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, we also started a podcast after, the, uh, after we stopped doing the television show. We started doing a podcast, uh, The Empty Chair, and we've been doing it two years. And we sold advertisement. And the advertisement we sold, all the money we made, went towards scholarship to get people into a good, sober living home. Nice. And I can't tell you, uh, out of all the things I've done over 20 years or so, uh, this has been the absolute... Uh, rewarding. Yeah. Most rewarding. Because you... you well, I'll tell you, the way it works is uh, we'll get someone as a rule who's graduating from a halfway house, mm -hmm. and uh, they'll know about our scholarship program. They'll get in touch with me, and I'll talk to each individual. And in many cases, if they're local, I'll go over and see them, have a talk with them, and uh, I'll talk to their clinician. I'll talk to the sober living home where they're going to go. And uh, if it all clicks, then what we will do is we'll try to give them one month of... Uh, rent mm -hmm. for that sober living home and in that time there it gives them the opportunity to get a job you know they're not pressured to pay their rent for a month and what it is is uh see people who, a lot of with my daughter i'm going to give an example my daughter went to to me one of the best uh, sober living uh one of the best halfway houses 
in the area. She uh, went uh, to Woman's View in Lawrence, right on Haverhill Street. Saved my daughter's life. But she graduated there after about seven months, then went to a rooming house, had a needle in her arm two weeks later. Wow. So it was pretty much then I decided you got to have a step down. So what the meaning of this scholarship was that we would, after they graduated, we'd put them in a sober living home where they have a little more freedom, but they still have structure. Structure. That's a big thing. It truly, truly is. And... I am so pleased to say that over the last two years, we've done, I'm going to say approximately 30, maybe a little bit more, but we'll say 30 scholarships. And of those 30, roughly 23 of them are still clean and sober. That's awesome. And a couple of the ones That's that, an amazing statistic, by the way. Oh, don't, don't, don't gloss oh, over that. No, no. And, and you're right. The statistic, because as a rule, roughly 30% mm -hmm. of people in addiction Find long-term recovery. Long-term recovery is considered one year. Right. But even of those, um, we'll say seven or eight that didn't make it, two or three of them, they slipped or relapsed and went back in. And there was a few that didn't. And these two yeah, ladies... Yeah, introduce your guests. They've been yeah, sitting here listening to my nonsense for the last 20 minutes. So. This is uh, Sandra, who has been... Who, uh, got Sandy. In September? All right, Sandra, Sandy. I like to you like Sandra. Do you like it either or? Uh, Sandra. Okay. Yeah. This is Sandra. Yeah. All right. I told you. You don't know. I'll, she I'll, told me she hey, wanted to be called Sandy, hey, so I'll what do I know? Sit back, sit back. Relax. I'll all take right, over. You take over the show. All right. <laughs> this is Sandra, who, who is the type of uh, person that, as a rule, I would not give a scholarship to. Because but she she's beautiful. She would have got my first scholarship. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you would have. But she wasn't coming out of a program. And usually, I only do... Because of... The majority of the ones that haven't been successful are ones I either took out of detox or off the street or what, mm -hmm. but they'd convince me, and you, and you want to give them a shot. Sandra convinced me. She was very persuasive, <laughs> and we gave her the scholarship, mm -hmm. and she went to Good Marks, mm -hmm. Sober Living Home, which we love, in yes, Lawrence. It's fantastic. And what's your job over there now? I manage the women. I'm a house manager. She's a house manager over there. Wow. Mm -hmm. And Ashley, who I met not too, too long ago, and obviously uh, she graduated from a place that I have a lot of affection for. Uh, she graduated from Women's View mm -hmm. and, just grad and just moved in now to Good Max. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have very high hopes. So I'd for like her. each of the each of the two ladies, Ashley and Sandy, Sandy, Sand, slash Sandra, slash Sandy, to um, <laughs> to talk about the the facilities that you're in sure. and what they're like. Okay. Um, good marks. Good marks is more of uh, an advanced recovery home for women. Um, it's independent living. Um, it's a stepping stool above a structured program, mm. which in titles women to be able to get on their feet, get work, and you know continue their lives sober. Um, the director and owner patients. Fatar, Fatar. I have a hard time with that name, too. Yeah. Um, she's fantastic. Um, you know, God put it on her heart to open a place because she saw a need, and, you know, the magic happened. And she's been up and running. She just. How, how, did, how, does, the, how does the facility work? How, how, walk us through the process. Someone comes in from where, and then how do you handle them? Okay. Um, well, somebody will come in, and um, they'll get an evaluation. Um, through patients, and she'll decide um, just with her own, you know, reading of people whether or not they'd be a good fit for the house. Um, sometimes probation or parole will send women to us, mm -hmm. and um, you know, we'll take them in if they have, if we have enough room. Um, and that's pretty much it. it you know, it's. Is, is, whether you're a, is it, is it whether just you're a place a to fit. stay, or is it a place that you live and you also get treatment? You also get it's it's residential living. Um, we uh, all women are account held accountable uh, for their sobriety. There are um, random testing. random testing twice a week. Um, you know, and if anybody should have have a relapse, um, you know, it's addressed and each it's all individually cased, uh, depending on the person where they are in their sobriety. Um, and how is this funded? She 
It, she funds it. It's she private. It's, it's, our, it's self funded. She wow. bought the house. It, yeah, it's a sober and, living home. Yes. It's, wow. yeah. Yes, it's privately owned. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's like House of Mercy. I don't know if you've been down to House of Mercy, but yes. I went in thinking that, you know, they had done this with, you know, a, $5 million in federal grants, and they're like, mm. no, George took no. the money out of his own pocket. That's no. right. That's yeah. right. Almost, just, almost George is fantastic. He's, he's phenomenal. He's, he's, he's um, you know, very special yeah. man. Almost all sober living homes are private. Really? You have a few. So I didn't that, realize that. Yeah. May, maybe, you know, you have a few that come down off of the link house that might get, but for the most part, they're all privately right. funded. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And how many women do you have there? We have 14 women, 14 beds. And it's right called. Now. And, and that, Good that's Marks. A, that's Good Marks LLC. That's the limit, too, right? Or, or that's the limit for now. We're looking to open up a few more beds. Good. I'm Good. sorry, how many did you say? 14. 14. Wow. Mm -hmm. So she's got to manage 14 women who are in recovery, and that can't be easy. It's, yeah, it, it's, we actually have a fantastic crew right now. Um, you know, we don't really have to worry about anybody stealing or, you know, any of that addictive behavior that sometimes once you become sober, you still have those addictive behaviors. Right. You know, um, so uh, as of right now, we have a really great crew. Yeah. So, this and this is in Lawrence. Yeah, it's in actually, Lawrence. Yes, right up by the reservoir. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, beautiful, beautiful home. It is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, if you guys ever need a volunteer, yeah, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm always here for you. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Ashley, Thank tell you. us about you. Tell us about your story. Ashley's the newbie. I am. <laughs> um, well, I came from uh, Women's View Halfway House. Um, so you know Karina? I do know Karina. She, Karina's wonderful. Yes, She's one of my she favorite is. people in the world. She is. Um, actually, I was there for six and a half months, mm -hmm. um, graduating next Monday. Um, I finished up there this Monday and moved into Good Marks. Wow. Yeah, but you know, an important thing about Ashley, this is her first attempt at recovery. Wow. Mm -hmm. First attempt. It is. So if you don't mind, can I? Can we? Can we? Can we get down in the weeds a little bit? Sure. Can you tell us about your addiction? Where, where were you living? How did it happen? How long were you on the streets? Or were you on the streets? I was on the streets briefly. Um, so I kind of call myself a chronic drug switcher. Started with alcohol, then I went to pills, and then you know I went in the methadone clinic to get off of pills, and then I turned to cocaine, and then I became homeless and. Put myself into. Oh, I got in trouble with the law as well. Yeah. And Tends then, to happen when you're oh, yeah. taking mm -hmm. drugs, and especially when you have when you have nowhere to stay. Right. You know, so it was a tough battle. How long were you on the streets? Not very long, maybe a month or so. Oh, okay. All right. And where did you stay? Like, where did you enough. where did you live for that month that you were on the streets? Where did Where did you go? Where did you sleep at night? Um, I really didn't. I made sure that I stayed awake all the time. Wow. It was It was pretty cold. It was you know miserable. So you went like under the bridge or in any of these little tent cities that they set up? No. Like there's all these little communities now that have all... No, you know. and I was also um, in North Central Mass. I wasn't here. Okay. I came to Lawrence for recovery. So that's important to know too. Oh, yeah. It well, is. I'm glad you And where are you from originally? Um, I was from Winchenden, Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. All right. Not a place you would think of for, you know, an opioid no. situation. But right. as we learned last week, even Boxford, Massachusetts, you know, a right. tiny sleepy little town has issues, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about, about your, if you don't mind, you know, just getting down in the weeds about your addiction, how you became addicted and what you were addicted to? Um, okay. So, um, because there's people watching who might be where you were, and I yeah, want them to be able to relate. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, my addiction brought me to oh, some pretty scary and dangerous places. Um, yeah, start with those. So let's no, let's let's start how it started off. Um, you know, uh, 14 years old, I think I started smoking marijuana. Wow. Um, you know, I led a. Um, a, a I had a rough childhood, so um, I guess I'm learning that you know, things that had happened in my childhood are, you know, part to, p part of um, why I would go out and use, you mm -hmm. know, filling a void that needed to be filled. Um, as a teenager, I would drink, I would drink before school, um, and, you know, I didn't get into too much trouble, um, but after that, you know, it turned into the you know, like a sweatshirt, you know, um, and then it was cocaine. And then in my 20s, I was introduced to Percocet. Mm -hmm. um, so I... Recreationally or did you have like a medical well, issue? I had a medical it? issue and, it's always how it and starts, I needed yeah. it. And that's how I became addicted to opiates. Oh. Um, by the grace of God, um, I knew enough not to play with heroin. 
Um, not that that makes me any better because it doesn't. Um, addiction is addiction, mm -hmm. regardless of what it is. And um, at least you're not worried about the fentanyl and the lacing and all that other stuff. Yeah, you're just taking Percocets yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. that it's better, but well, nowadays on the streets, I'm finding that That's, you know I'm these glad you said these this. these uh, drug dealers are making um, pills and they're calling them Percocet. Sure. They're pressing their um, own pills. They're they're making their own it's pills fentanyl. with fentanyl. Really? And oh, they're yeah. calling them yeah. Percocet, selling them as Percocet. Wow. Um, right well, down to the, the numbers and the letters. Yes. And the they're, even, yep. they're cutting it with cocaine. They're cutting mm -hmm. it with pills. Wow. They're cutting mm -hmm. it with fentanyl. You know, it's a business. Yeah. And they're yeah. cutting it with everything. Yeah, now. it's yeah. pretty sad. It is. They should all go to hell, every one of them. I oh, hope so. You know, and I think they will. I think God's got uh, a plan well, I know, for Trump, everybody. Trump, so. Trump just let out a whole bunch of people out of jail because they were drug dealers, and that's considered a nonviolent crime. And if you ask me, that's probably one of the most violent crime you can uh, you, you can engage in. If you're selling drugs to people who are addicted, mm -hmm. to me, that especially if it's fentanyl. Well, yeah. I um, sold drugs to keep up with my habit. That's right. Mm -hmm. so, I'm glad you said mm -hmm. that, I mean, too. Mm -hmm. Am I a criminal? Yes, I was doing something illegal, but... I was doing it to feed my addiction, mm -hmm. not to hurt anyone else. And, and mm -hmm. you know, and and let me put let me put it this way. Yeah, uh, if she was selling something that had fentanyl in it and somebody died from it, yeah, she should be punished. Mm -hmm. But you do have to understand someone who's selling it to survive, as opposed to someone who's selling it. To make a well, I was talking about people that are right. manufacturing pills that are fentanyl and then put, right. passing them off as Percocet well, they with do. the numbers right. and all that stuff. But that I'm gonna, the one who manufactures it, the one who's really making the big money is usually not the one selling it. He's giving it to young ladies right. like this. Right. So let them take the risk mm. and let them, you know, and, and that's mm. what is it. You know, it, 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 drug addiction is so complex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't get At one time, uh, I thought every... One who sold drugs should be castrated. Uh, I don't feel that way anymore because I've met a lot of people that I've given scholarships to. I've met a lot of people that I've had guests on that, yeah, sold drugs and may have even been responsible for some deaths. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a disease that uh, people kind of make a social thing out of. I don't care how a person gets addicted, whether it's because of a, a genetic thing, because mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, because of uh, operation, peer pressure, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how they get there. Once they're there, they are very sick people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And unless you've actually watched somebody withdraw, mm -hmm. you know, you might want to ask them about how much fun it is to go through withdrawal. Well, I've got a great question. How much fun is it <laughs> to go through withdrawal? Not fun at all. We're going to give him his terrible. own show, Ed. It's absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, it's horrible. You're this? hot. You're cold. You're sick. You're shaking. Mm. And the only thing that's going to make it better is that next high. Yeah. yeah, that next fix. Right. My daughter used to explain it. She says it was like having the flu Times ten. Yeah, wow. times ten. I was just going to say okay. that. times a yeah. hundred. It's yeah. not. It's not nice. <laughs> times a hundred. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Because um, I've you, never you, had it. So yeah, times five hundred. Right, I'll buy right. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys went through the process of becoming <laughs> addicted, me. going through the withdrawals. Now you're at least for now, hopefully and forever sober. Mm -hmm. I bet you still have that. Craving. That cr yeah, the craving. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I tried to quit cigarettes like three times. Well, and I actually went back to it because I was thinking about cigarettes every single day. I wasn't smoking, <laughs> but I was thinking about, and it, it invaded. I couldn't get work done. I'm like, maybe if I just sneak one hit off a cigarette, maybe if I just go buy one pack. And I can't even imagine what it would be like for something like heroin and fentanyl, which has got to be way more addictive, right? Um, well, uh, not really. You know, I was just we, Phil and I were just discuss discussing this uh, before we came in. Um, of all the things I've ever tried to quit, cigarettes were the worst. Really, yeah. they were the hardest. Really? Not physically. But the, well, I guess the physical addiction, yeah. um, the craving-wise, craving yeah, right. because you got to think, you know, you're smoking, you know, a pack a day, maybe even more, or maybe even, uh, you know, a few less. I'm at but, two. I'm at two packs a day. So that's a lot of cigarettes, yeah. you know, um, and those cravings are so frequent, then you have to fight off a craving each time mm -hmm. you, you know. And that's a two. That's two minutes of the day that you have to sit there and talk yourself out of it, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas um, 
addiction to you know any other substance is the the cravings are not as frequent you know what you get so sober. yeah and um you know what they're putting so many things on cigarettes now that it's they make them extra super addictive right. but it's you know? a good example you know you you talk about how hard it is to get off cigarettes mm-hmm. and you'll find that a lot of Addicts in recovery are still addicted to either cigarettes, cigarettes. or coffee. Cigarettes and coffee. Yeah. Both, well, you know? <laughs> cigarettes and coffee. Yeah. Yeah. See? There you go. See? All right. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people in recovery, they, you know, you have to have something. Right. And, uh, you know, do they know it's bad for them? Yeah. But do they think it might kill them? Yeah. But maybe 20 years yeah, from now, 20, right. years not from when now. you wake up the next right, morning. Right. And, and I think a lot of it comes yeah. to that. Well, right. the way I look at it, it is, you know, one, one thing at a time. Right. You know, exactly. and the, the, the more you re- remove the toxins from your body, the, you know, the more you want to remove the rest of it. Right. You know, eventually as you, I, I, you know, if I didn't have a spiritual awakening, I wouldn't have yeah. um, been able to get through yeah. Well, my addiction process. Yeah, let me let me tell you something about it, people who really find recovery. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Sandra is a longer example. Ashley is learning it. I've seen it with my daughter. I've seen it with her wife, my daughter-in-law Victoria. And you see somebody who really grasps recovery, the gratitude they have. Mm-hmm. They turn into the kind of person you wish you could be. Mm. They're just so grateful for the smallest things, you know? Mm. I mean, if they have a bed to sleep in, they're grateful. If they have mm-hmm. a meal, they're grateful. Mm-hmm. God, if they get a job and a license, mm-hmm. they're super grateful. Right. Things mm-hmm. that so many of us take, take for, for granted. granted. Right. And I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I you know, I go to all my daughter's celebrations. I go to my daughter-in-law's celebration. People in her, I'll probably be going to Ashley's celebration. <laughs> uh, all the ones in our, uh, in our scholarship. And you just see this, the type of people they turn into. Uh, I wish people could understand. That's like when we have them on our show, and I'm going to do it right now. You, you guys look at her. Do they look like drug addicts? No. No, they do not. They're just really good. If we, if we were to clatter, I'd be buying them drinks. And, well, <laughs> well, and I'd we kick drink. you in the ass if you did. I'm sure you would. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what I want you to know is people in recovery, they're just the nicest. And that's why, you know, when we lose someone in recovery, when someone relapses and, and we lose them and they die of an overdose, even if you didn't know, when you hear about it, you know, it just takes a little bit more out of your heart. Yeah. So one of the things that I noticed doing homeless outreach and dealing with addicts on the streets is that they, uh, usually by the time they get to the streets, they've destroyed every relationship they've ever had. Very true. They've stolen from their parents. They've, they've betrayed their boyfriends or husbands. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, they've, you know, they've betrayed their landlords. They've run up electric bills that they can now mm-hmm. never pay to get mm-hmm. back onto the grid. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you guys handled that? And afterwards... Did, how did you try to repair that? It's, it's awfully tough um, once, you've, once you've gone down that road. It is so hard to repair those relationships. Um, I'm actually still trying to repair mm-hmm. the relationship with mm-hmm. my kids right exactly, now. Exactly, yeah. Um, but like my father, I hadn't seen him in like a year. My twin brother, I didn't see in about two years. This year, I was invited to Christmas. This year, I was invited to stay in my family's home. Oh, that's nice. So, I mean, it comes with time. Yeah. And, and you need to gain their trust again. Mm-hmm. It's not something that you know, you can just make happen like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, no. it's difficult. It's really hard because you go from having no support system, nothing, to basically making your own. Yeah. And hopefully including those people that you burn bridges with. All right. How about you, Sandra? Um, Slash Sandra. In, Slash. in my opinion, um, you know, I'm realizing in, in life, okay, so, um, you know, I have family, but they're very, they're distant. Um, but I'm realizing that, you know, a lot of... Um, the no not having contact with them or very little contact with them is not necessarily all my doing um you know everybody's in their own place in life um so you can't always uh blame yourself Mm -hmm. for stuff like that um what else what was the other question well no i was just wondering the relationships that that you oh, either destroyed uh, while bills, you were... Bills, bills. Um, yeah. I've, I've ruined um, 
my gosh, I've ruined a couple of very long-term relationships. Um, I'm in the process of bills and stuff. Um, going through a divorce, so um, in the process of trying to pick up the mess of, you know, that electric bill and that, you know, and it, and it can be very overwhelming. Right. Um, you know, it's it's like you're trying to tread water when you're just, when you're fresh and, you know, fresh in recovery. Um, so even, even a year in recovery is still fresh to me, you know, so because it takes time, right. you know, first we deal with our emotions, first we do, and then we deal with, you know, the consequences of the people that we've affected in our lives. Um, you know, um, learning to not blame yourself fully for, for everything, mm -hmm. uh, because everything happens for a reason, you know, um, part of it is owning your part in it. That true. Yeah, of course. And you know, being honest with yourself and yeah. everybody else. I mean, yeah. if you can't be honest with yourself, then you can't be honest with anyone else. Exactly. See, I brought it up because my sister went into recovery, I think five times before she finally got sober. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And she was on it everything. Happens. Heroin, meth, coke. She was on, mm -hmm. she was on all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and when she was on the streets, she said she she didn't think that her the family would ever forgive her for what she had done, mm -hmm. whether it was stealing from them to pay for drugs or betraying them or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I do hear it from people on the streets who are addicted all the time when I say, well, you know, do you have family in the area? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, but they'll never speak to me again. And when she went finally for her sixth time at Teen Challenge up mm -hmm. in Bradford, mm -hmm. um, and she now works there... Um, the family re-embraced her. Now, I know that doesn't mm -hmm. always happen, mm -hmm. but I try to tell people on the streets that, you know, you might think that your family hates you right now because mm -hmm. they're not speaking to you because of what happened, but their heart is still breaking because of what happened. Mm -hmm. And if Absolutely. you make the effort to try to get clean, if you come with us to Tewksbury, if you let me call Carrie and get you a bed, mm -hmm. you know, that starts you back on your way to repairing that relationship mm -hmm. and nobody believes it. No, none of them believe them. it. None of them believe it. You have it. to show them. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to get clean. Yeah. I'm going to get clean. Well, and I'll tell you another and. Like, whenever we do a scholarship, you know, whenever I talk to any of the ones who are getting the scholarship, I always try to get their parents' phone number, mm -hmm. family's phone number. I'll either talk to them. If they're in the neighborhood, we'll invite them to our support group. If they're not, then we'll mm -hmm. talk on the phone a few times. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the family plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. And families have to learn not only how to deal with someone in addiction, mm -hmm. but they also have to learn how to deal with somebody in recovery. It's mm -hmm. a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, and once they learn that, because you're right, the trust, my daughter's been clean going on 12 years. Do I trust her 100%? I wish I could say I did, mm -hmm. but no, but I can't. don't. Because you're always afraid that this life crisis is going to come up that might be a trigger for them to right. go off. Right. So, I mean, but and that's why after all these years, I still go to my weekly family support group because, you know, I hopefully I can help others that are struggling, but they also help me to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, deal with somebody who's in long-term recovery. How many times did you try recovery before you got clean? This is my first time. This is time. first. This is so your can, first. Yeah. So God yeah. bless you. Absolutely. Good, good, good luck. What about you, Sandra? Many. Really? I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you exact yeah. an exact number. A lot though. I a good handful. Yeah. Yeah. Probably and, two hands. And does it does this feel now that you're in this structured environment at at Mark it's called Mark's house? Good, good Marks. Marks. Good Mark's good house. Marks. Um do, do you do you feel like you've got a better chance at staying sober with the environment that you're in? Um yes. Uh I was sober before I, I before I went there. Um but yes, you know, it hold it holds it holds everybody accountable you know, for, mm -hmm. for their actions. Um, so, yeah. So we talked about relationships and, and the relationships when you were using. Now you're in recovery. It must be hard now to also have relationships, whether you meet a new guy, a boyfriend, whatever, because, you know, now you've got at some point, you've got to tell them your history and nobody mm -hmm. wants to do that on a first or second date, right? So how has that been? How has that been for you guys? Well, <laughs> In my opinion, if, if they... When they pause like that, you know that was a good question. <laughs> yeah. good well, that, that, theoretically, they have a timeline before they're supposed to start a relationship. Oh, good. Well, theoretically. Yeah, well, in, in AA... Everybody theoretic doesn't, theoretically. In, in AA, everybody doesn't play the rules, but yeah. Yeah, in AA, they say, wait, uh, a year. Yeah, you know, exactly. Uh, before you try and get into another relationship. Um, it's not a hard, if fast If somebody rule. isn't going <laughs> to accept me for, for who I am and the person that I am 
today and sober if they're afraid of a relapse or addiction because I get it because I fear dating somebody who does drink mm -hmm. or do drugs sure. or or is in uh, an ex addict you know um, I think the biggest fear in the dating scene from the people that I've talked to is not so much that the other person had an addiction and they might relapse, but it's the disease issue. If they were shooting up, if they were on the streets, who knows what this person might have, and they flee. You know, they find out that they're dating someone that had an addiction once, and they just they they just run, they run yeah. away. Well, to be yeah. honest with you, somebody, not me, by the way, but yeah. everybody else. Somebody who has an addiction, I don't even think. Let me put it this way: no, somebody so who's in an out. honest recovery won't start a relationship without them knowing mm -hmm. off the get-go. Okay. Right. Because people in recovery, in real recovery, are probably the most honest people you'll ever meet in your life. Yes. Wow. They'll never make politicians, by the wow. way. <laughs> so too, I, too honest. So we see a lot of couples on the streets. Yes. And we had Joe and Marla. We actually tried to get them to come on. Oh, do you know Joe and yes, Marla? Yes, I do. Can I, can I just say Absolutely. something? Absolutely. Um, um, so also another homeless help is um, Merrimack Valley Dream Center. Oh, yeah. um, and I am part of the, the Dream Center, and what we do is we hand out bag lunches every Saturday morning um, to the homeless. And, Where is this? And we pray for them. So we meet in Pinkerton Park, um, 9 o'clock on Saturday mornings. Somebody brings bag lunches. 9 o'clock is awfully early. That's okay. Like, like I was going to offer to join you. No, I was going to offer to join you, but 9 a.m., Ed, I don't know about that. Early. That's the middle of the day not, for them guys. Yeah, yeah, it's not for an addict, that's for sure. Um, so, and we bring lunches to them instead of having a place where they have to meet us. Okay. Um, so we go to them where they are and, um, offer them lunch and offer them prayer. And so that's where you met you Joe know, and Marla in hopes. That's where I met Joe and Marla. Yep. Yes. And they are fantastic. Fantastic. They've been clean now for a little while. Mm -hmm. I know Carrie got them in in, in, in Tewksbury and they didn't want to go if they couldn't go together. And they mm -hmm. went together, and then they signed themselves out. We all got mad, mm -hmm. and we all yelled at them. We took turns finding them and yelling at them for signing <laughs> themselves out. Yeah. And they eventually did go back in, and they've been clean now for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad that you guys know them. But yeah. I, I was bringing up what I was trying to bring up was that we find a lot of couples on the streets that are addicted, and they're together. Yeah. And they, a lot of them have found themselves through the addiction, not that they knew each other before. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I always wonder if that having that other person enabling you makes it harder to get clean. Well, yeah, we saw it with Joe and Marla. That's yeah, why I, I brought it up. Yeah, mm -hmm. recovery course. as a rule, and it's you know it's not a hard fast rule. Recovery doesn't usually work good on the buddy system. Right, no. right. No. You have to, you have to, you have to learn to love yourself enough yeah. to want it for yourself, yeah. and right. not have to worry about yeah. right. that other person because without yourself, you're you really yeah. nobody. Working on your own recovery is hard enough. Exactly. Without having exactly, you know, the other one will bring you down before you'll. And a lot of okay. times, um, people that are using together in relationship, that's how they get together. Right. You know, friends. Hey, let's. You know, I have this. You have that. Let's yeah, get together it. and hang out. Can I and ask then, them a question? Sure. Because absolutely. I you know, I know we're getting close to the end. I wanna give MVP Your questions are better than mine anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna give MVP ASAP and my good friend Cole Welch a plug. The scholarship program that you guys applied through to MVP ASAP, mm. what did it mean to actually get it and how did it help you progress into your recovery? You first. I was so excited when I when I got the scholarship. Um so I had been working in the halfway house, but, you know, I'm still trying to pay off debt. I'm still trying to, you know, find transportation to to see my kids, hopefully when they're ready. And, you know, getting the first months paid for, it's, it's amazing because I am able now to save money. I'm able to, you know, have a plan of how I'm going to pay for mm -hmm. the rest of the months I'm there. Right. One it's, of the things, one of the things that we found is that you, you, when people are homeless, regardless of the addiction issue, they, when they've been homeless for a while, they used to have an apartment and they ran up their electric bill, their phone mm -hmm. bill, their mm -hmm. heating bill, and now yeah. they, they now they want to get Credit off the cards. street, but there's no way to do that because mm -hmm. you can't move into a place and call the electric company and go, hey, forget that two thousand dollars that yeah, I owe you. Yeah, that's where I'm exactly. at right now. Right. And so, so there's got to be. We're we're always talking at TMF about how, you know how we can find a way to help people that have that issue. To be able to move into some place where they're not having the electricity in their own name and do what you're doing. Just put a little money aside, maybe eat that down a little bit, maybe make a $20 mm -hmm. a month payment on it. Mm -hmm. 
so that they can go out and be on their own eventually. Mm, because mm. I need to do that myself. And right. that's, you know, it's tough because yeah. my electric bill, I don't even know. It's over $2,000. Yeah. Yeah. I was homeless. Yeah. And I slept in my car for almost a summer. Mm-hmm. And I would moved out of a place and I knew that I was getting evicted. Somebody was buying the house. I knew they were going to evict me. So I stopped paying everything. I didn't pay my, I'm on my 20s. I didn't pay my rent. I didn't pay my electricity. I didn't pay, and I ran everything up. Mm-hmm. And then I was out. And I figured I'd be able to find a place and didn't. So I ended up sleeping in my car. And when I finally had like a friend say, hey, you can come stay with me for a little while until you get your own place. But that'll be like a month, right? I'm thinking, well, if you're going to say yes to that, right? You're going to lie and go, oh, yeah, yeah, it'll just be a month. But once you get there, you're like, well, I can't go out and get my own apartment because I have, I have bad, like you said, bad credit yeah. and I have all these bills. Yeah, it's very difficult. And it's very, very, very hard. Yes. It's very hard. So what I did, I started my own business. Yeah. And I put, well, into the biz- I put everything into the business name. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. Right? <laughs> Not yeah. all of us have the means yeah. to start a business right. yet either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you know, addicts are actually very intelligent people. And yeah. very manipulative, we've found. Uh, they, well, they can be. But yeah. it's, all, be. it's all about being honest with yourself yeah. and, about, and with the people that surround you, mm-hmm. you know. Um, let me answer Phil's question really quick. Okay. Um, I was I, hoping you would. Actually, I, yeah. I got. I got. I, I got wouldn't a, let you forget. I got help um, with the sponsorship. I got a donation of five hundred dollars to help me get into good marks. Where I was before, I was staying in a rooming house with a friend. Um, due to uh, my divorce um, and my leaving, leaving my home. Um, so, staying with that friend um, who wasn't very um, helpful to me. Uh, I don't want to say helpful because she's very helpful. Um, although. I was triggered in the place that, that I was at. Let me just say that. Okay. So, and, um, you know, it was a blessing because, you know, it gave me the opportunity because I got the okay to move into good marks, but I didn't have all the funds to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I needed a little bit of help. And they give you the free first month free and then you have to pay, you have to go out and get well, your own job. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's an individual case. I got $500 yep. towards it. Um, so I got three weeks of rent free, yep. which is perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the meantime, um, I went there telling patients that I wanted to be the house manager and that because I'm, you know, I know who I am and I'm still in my recovery and I'm very good with the women and, you know, supportive and compassionate. And, and two months later, she just, you know, she gave me an application and said, fill this out, you yeah, know. Well, let let um, me tell you something, you know, why I'm so proud of her is... Uh, <laughs> As a rule, we give scholarships to those like Ashley graduating from a, a, a program. I've probably only done maybe four or five from people out in the street. Mm. And this young lady mm. is the only one that has really taken advantage. Mm-hmm. And she convinced me and patience convinced mm-hmm. me that mm-hmm. she was worth the effort. Mm. And she's proven her worth because, uh, yeah. yes, Theoretically, I would not give her a scholarship because of the uh, the unsuccessful things I've had. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But she kind of made a believer out of me that yeah, we can take that leap of faith. And uh, it's all about mm-hmm. how bad you want it. Yeah. You so know? now you give these scholarships and you get the money from the advertising on your podcast. How else can how if someone wants to donate money? Because this to me seems like I, I'm you know I don't know if you've never seen my podcast, but I'm sure you probably have. Yeah, I have. I'm always telling people not to give. Right. Mm-hmm. Don't give. Don't give to the UNICEF. Right. Don't give yep. to, because all these groups they have CEOs that make three million a year and the money doesn't go where it's supposed to. No. Right. But at the local level, we see House of Mercy mm-hmm. and we see some of these yeah. other groups. Hundred mm-hmm. percent of what you, you give goes where it wants to go. And yeah. I think this would be a right. good. Yeah. A good and, and to be honest, like uh, we do a podcast and we've been doing it two years and we usually generate five or six thousand dollars each six month period. So we've generated over twenty thousand. Plus, again, our good friend uh, Diana Zoglio has gotten us earmarks for the last three years of She's 20000 so awesome. And we usually use half of that towards uh, scholarships also. So any, And you want to know something we've, we've also had? We've had people uh, that know me who have lost loved ones due to addiction, mm-hmm. and they'll put in the paper, you know, make contributions to MVP ASAP, mm-hmm. the empty chair. Sure. So, yeah, we, we do have... Uh, Donations coming in like that, and anybody, uh, what I want everybody to know is every single dollar that we get goes towards the scholarship. That's and great. that includes even the money we have to pay for a podcast that comes out of a separate fund from MBPA. Oh, but every dollar we get on advertising goes, and again, from the memorial donations, every dollar 
goes to get young ladies like this into a sober living home and give them a chance. And we're so grateful for it. Thank yes. you so much. I know you Thank are. Thank you very so, much. So how can oh, people, I how can people donate? You, how can they donate? You go to... Uh, you go to uh, website uh, mvpasap.com. Mvpasap. Mvpasap.com. You call Phil Leahy. Uh, you know, uh, my phone number's all over the place, 978-886-2949. You let me know, and I'll make arrangements. But, it, you know, it's – I got to be honest with you. The only reason, because I have been stepping back, you know, I, I gave up MVPASAP to uh, – Cole Welch, who is absolutely phenomenal. And she's also going to be taking over my podcast. I'm going to retire from that. But the only thing that's really kept me going so much is uh, the the scholarship. Oh, and by the way, there's one requirement. Everybody who gets a scholarship has to friend me. <laughs> okay. That way I can <laughs> that way I keep, keep an eye on. <laughs> I keep an eye on. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, you know, any of you that, you know, you see what these two young ladies are like. And like I said, we've done over 30 scholarships. And of those 30, between 22 and 23, are still living a really productive life in recovery. And uh, mm -hmm. i got to tell you, I can't even explain to you what it does, the personal gratification I mm -hmm. get when I see people like this doing so well. We're up against time, but I want to spend, can we spend like an extra two minutes? i got one more question, Ed. Two minutes? Yeah. For you? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> so one of the things that I always like, and we didn't talk about it today, so if you could just touch on it before we go. One of the things that I really admired about what you were doing when you started this, Phil, was trying to educate parents oh. who have no idea what's out there, who have no idea how to spot addiction, who have no idea what the warning signs are, and and really, I think, yeoman's work to be able to go out into the community and let these people, these parents know that there are people out there that, that have been through it, that have that helped work them through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because, again, when the new uh, city council takes office in Methuen, for the third time I will be going through a third different administration. And, again, trying to get them to form uh, an active task force. And not political. What I'm talking about, maybe a counselor, maybe a school committee person, people from the youth organization, athletics, teachers, parents. I want people who will actually sit down there. And, and you know what I've found? I mean, like I said, you, you said yourself, a lot of parents just don't want to get into it. We want to come up with ways, and we have some ways, that will almost force a parent to educate themselves. Mm -hmm. And... And if there is a solution, mm -hmm. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, what these two young ladies are doing is awesome, but the solution is to never be in the position these two young ladies are in. Parents have to teach their kids and teach themselves the dangers. Mm -hmm. So can I ask, as we, as we wrap up the show, can I ask you guys to come back in a year and talk about what the year was like? If sure. you're still sober, how hard it was, what you went through. Yeah. Um, because what we want to do is every year we, we have the police chiefs come in. Sure. And we want to try and update people and let them know what's going on. And I also have a charity bash that I do every year on March 27th this year. We'd love to have the three of you. I'll give you some free tickets. Yeah, we'd love We'd love to have you come and network with some of the people that – you know, are on the other side of this mm -hmm. opioid crisis, the parents and the, and the TMF kids and all the other people mm -hmm. that volunteer. And let me put time. it this way. If they're not sober, chances are they won't come back. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, listen, if you're not sober, not an option. if you're not sober, we still want you to come back. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, my sister took her set almost six times, five or six times. Sure. I might have the number wrong, but it was either five or six times. And one of the things that Charlie Baker uh, said when he got reelected, I think during one of his speeches, was that people need to understand that if you fail the first time, you're not a failure. That it takes sometimes a lo three or four or five times. And as long as you keep getting up and keep trying, you're not a failure just because you failed you know, at your first tr try at recovery or second By try the way, recovery. outside of a politician, Diane DeZoglio, Charlie Baker gets it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know something? It's all about education. You can't just say, oh, because most people will say, you know, oh, they relapsed, they're just, yeah. oh, you know, they're worthless. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, once people are educated and they actually understand the disease of addiction, yeah. that's when they can really understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's what you yeah. learn. True. You know, it's not the re relapse that's dangerous. It's what, if anything, you learn after you relapse. If you mm -hmm. take that relapse and bring it into your recovery, relapse, good friend of mine, no longer with us, Joe Cotton from the Psychological Center, mm -hmm. used to tell us relapse is part of recovery. Right. Yes. And it's what you learn from it. That's true. Right. Mm -hmm. That's Phil true. Leahy, Sandra, 
uh, Ashley, thank you so much for coming in on the Paying Attention podcast. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in March. I'm also looking forward to see you back a year from now. Love to hear your stories about how you're helping other people. Maybe you can bring other people in that you've helped to inspire to become uh, to become sober. I want to thank our sponsors, Climate Design Systems. Nina over at Climate Design Systems. We love her. Uh, the Methuen Police Superior Officers Union sponsoring the show and pissing off Jim McCarty, which is really, really making me happy every day. Uh, the AFC Urgent Care. We love Lisa Williams. She does a lot for the community. She does a lot for the kids. And you don't have to sit at Holy Family for four hours waiting to be seen by a doctor. Five minutes, <laughs> ten minutes, you're in and out of AFC Urgent Care. Marku Towing. Uh, Jason Marku donates uh, coffee and hot chocolate to the TMF Family Dinner for the Homeless every Wednesday night. Ronnie Marsan. Marsan and Son Constructions. And and Century 21, McLennan and Company, we love them. Her and Matt uh, have come to the bash a couple of times, and we ap- certainly appreciate their help with our scholarship uh, our scholarship drive. Ed Sullivan, thank you so much for being our fine, fine producer My today. My pleasure. Melvin Taylor says we got to go home, so go home already. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.